Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim podcast. Very, very excited about today's show because we have a, a, a wonderful man uh, personally, uh, been, been a wonderful uh, person to work with over email and a wonderful supporter and collaborator and also just a man who is certainly very busy. He is a internationally renowned expert in chronic disease prevention and weight management, recognized in 2012 as one of the most influential figures in health promotion. He is a specialist in preventative medicine and the founding director of Yale University's Prevention Research Center. He's the author of 12 books, 12, the most recent of which is called Disease Proof, The Remarkable Truth About What Makes Us Well. And, 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 he's Dr. David Katz. Dr. Katz, welcome to the show. Boy, Jonathan, that, that energy level is going to be hard to match. Thank you. I'm going to try to keep, I'll try to keep up with you, my friend. Thanks so much. Well, I am excited because I am holding in my hands a book by you, sir, that says that I can slash my risk of chronic disease by 80%. So how, how can I not be excited? I, I agree with you. I think it's an incredibly exciting opportunity. And the tragic thing is it's accessible to everybody and almost no one is taking advantage of it. And we're really hoping with this book to put that power in people's hands so we start getting real use of it. Because uh, you know knowledge is only power when you do put it to use. And... Uh, that's the potential. We, we really could eliminate 80% of all chronic disease. And I agree with you. It, it's, it's incredibly exciting, Jonathan, and, and partly so because of how intimate it is. You know, I, I'm a public health guy. Uh, you know, I know you're very interested in making contributions to the, the public health as well, but th there's a problem in efforts to advance public health. And that problem is pretty big. It's the fact that there is no public that there's you and there's me and there's everybody else. And when we talk about the public, it's everybody, but it's also nobody. And one of the things we want to fix with disease proof is that mistake to think that when we talk about the strategies that would prevent heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, that, that it's about some anonymous public. It's about you and me. For example, uh, do you love somebody who's been affected by heart disease? Heart disease does not run in my family, but diabetes does. So definitely okay, so diabetes. Diabetes or, or cancer or stroke. You know, if you list just those top four disease killers in the United States to almost any audience anywhere, and I do this as a matter of routine, and, and you ask audience members, do you love somebody who's been affected by heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes? By the time you get through that list of just the top four chronic diseases, almost every hand in almost every auditorium in almost every venue in the country is up. And an 80% reduction in the rate of chronic disease means eight out of 10 of those hands in a given room would not have been raised in the first place. And you know, when those hands go up, they are testimony to terrible days, you know, days where you get a phone call about somebody you love who is in an ambulance on their way to the hospital or in the ICU or in the CCU or in the emergency department. And, you know, sometimes they get better and come home, and sometimes they don't. But either way, you know, th those are anxious, dreadful days. And almost all of us have lived through them, most of us more than once. And, you know, when you think about someone you love affected by heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, you know, for many of us, it's more than one person. Eight out of 10 of those bad days don't need to happen. And, and we look ahead to a future where we either bequeath to our kids a world in which those days happen ever more often at ever younger age, and you know those hands go up in the air that much uh, uh, more routinely, or eight times in ten those days simply don't happen at all. That's the power of disease proofing. It's incredible power. It's incredibly intimate. So yes, I'm excited too about this message. David, I'm so happy that you brought up that point of intimacy. It's a it's a brilliant point, and I'm curious. You you've been all over the world. I mean, you you are one of the most uh, let's let's call it active voices in this community on on many levels and it seems it seems quite clear 
what we need to do, you know, we need to take in more nutritious foods. We need to stop eating things that aren't really food. We need to move our bodies. We need to get proper sleep. Like we, we know these things yet uh, the the motivation seems not strong enough. Let me give a concrete example. So becoming a vegetarian, which is certainly not the point uh, or, or topic uh, of this show, but becoming a vegetarian is a very significant lifestyle change. But a lot of people are able to do it. And actually the people who do it, they don't, at least from my experience, they're not like, oh, this is so hard. Actually, they love it. Like they love being a vegetarian because they believe doing so will, will enable them to manifest a higher purpose. They believe in something. And the reason I get so excited excited about your point about it being intimate is believing that you can set an example where your children can avoid these terrible days, where you can avoid these terrible days, when those who rely on you can avoid these terrible days, and you can manifest all the glory that you were put on this world to manifest, that that seems inspirational and aspirational enough to, to get us to make these changes. What do you think? Uh, I think that's a great point. I, I agree with you. So I just want to dial it back a little bit and kind of run through what you just said, Jonathan, because there's a lot there. First, you hit a point that, that I wanted to get to, and that is we do indeed know what behavioral factors will eliminate 80% of chronic disease. And, and there's a literature in, in the peer-reviewed journals going back at least 20 years to what is widely recognized in preventive medicine circles as you know, it's almost scripture at this point. It's really a seminal study entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. The authors were Bill Fagey and Mike McGinnis, two leading epidemiologists. And essentially what they reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1993 is that the leading causes of premature death, and, and we can characterize that as years lost from life, but because these are chronic diseases, also life lost from years, the leading causes of premature death weren't really diseases because diseases are effects. And, and the question was what was causing the diseases that, that were in turn causing premature deaths? And the answer was a list of 10 factors which overwhelmingly we control in our daily lives. And as you just suggested, on the short list is diet. But essentially, the first three items on the list, tobacco, dietary pattern, and physical activity, accounted for 80% of all the premature deaths in the United States every year. In other words, if we didn't smoke, ate optimally, and were routinely physically active, and that led in turn to weight control, those four things would result in an 80% reduction in the lifetime risk of any major chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, all the bad stuff we don't want to have happen. So the first part of, of my response to your very insightful comment is feet, forks, and fingers are the master levers of medical destiny. What we do with our feet, physical activity, what we do with our forks, how we eat, and what we do with our fingers, namely not holding cigarettes, that's the power center right there. And the power center is great enough to actually alter gene expression. And, and we point all of this out in Disease Proof, that there are studies showing that lifestyle interventions can alter gene expression. They can increase the production of cancer prevention uh, proteins that, and, and reduce the production by our genes of cancer promoting proteins. So, you know, the, the question about which is the, the more important influence, nature or nurture, is almost a false question because we can nurture nature. We can change the expression of our genes with lifestyle. Your, your comment then went on to the issue of motivation. And I would say, you know, motivation falls within the realm of, of willpower, so the, the will to be healthy. And yes, I think you're right. I think, you know, having inspiration, having aspiration. You know, this is part of something bigger. It's about my health, but it's also about other things, making the world a better place. You know, I, I think people do buy into that. And I agree with you. Many of my friends and colleagues who are vegetarian or vegan, it's partly about health, but it's also partly about planetary stewardship and how other species are treated and their ethical implications. And, you know, it's part of a bigger mission. But there's another equally important component to all of this. You might want to climb Mount Everest. You might be highly motivated. You might think, gee, the most fantastic thing in the world would be to see the roof of the world, to see the, the, the view of planet Earth from as high up as you can get and still stand on your own two feet on solid ground. But no matter how badly you wanted to climb Everest, the fact would remain that it's an enormous mountain with lots of ice and snow on it. And unless you've got mountaineering skills, you're probably not going to get up there. You know, the, the, the average Joe just can't get to the top of Everest. That's all there is to it. You got to know what you're doing. And so with lifestyle change, 
a big part of the story that is routinely neglected is the analog to willpower. So you, you speak, I think, very insightfully about the motivation side. And, and we address motivation and willpower in disease proof. We then move on and say, but what about the skill power? What if you want it really badly? What if you really care about your health or the health of your children or the health of your grandchildren, but you really just don't have the skill set to get there from here? You really don't know what the more nutritious foods are. You really are duped by Madison Avenue. Uh, you really don't know how to figure out, you know, how to prepare family-friendly, nutritious meals every day given your crazy schedule. You're really not confident about how to work physical activity into the hectic demands of your daily routine. Well, all of that then becomes a matter for a skill set that most people don't have, but skills can be acquired. And, and in Disease Proof, we emphasize the motivation, the inspiration, the aspiration, the things you just referred to. We then say, given that, the job is still too hard for most people, and we can overcome that one of two ways. We can either change the whole world, and, and we advocate for that, you know, make, making the food environment a better food environment, making physical activity a routine part of the school day and the work day. But we can't just keep waiting on the world to change while our health goes to hell in a handbasket. So between here and there, we need to take matters into our own hands. And the way to do that is skillfully. And that requires skill power. So most of the book is actually devoted to a systematic delivery of the skill set that, for example, I have and share with my wife and, and my kids and, and my patients and that my co-author Stacey Colino has and shares with her family. What, what are the skills that people who manage to be healthy in spite of it all have that can be shared with everybody? What are all the ways to make good use of your feet and your fork? You know, obviously, tobacco is a relatively simple one, uh, but we do briefly address the issue of smoking cessation for those who need that help. But you know, mostly the challenge is, yes, I know that physical activity is, is good for me, but here's my daily routine. How do I make it happen? And yes, I know that supposedly eating well is good for me, but I'm not even sure I know what eating well is because there's so many competing opinions. You just mentioned vegetarianism, Jonathan, but you know, you, you could be doing a podcast with Lauren Cordain who would make an impassioned plea for a paleo diet with a very strong emphasis on meat intake. So you know, the, the average person listening in says, I'm confused. So we have to sort that out. What do we really know? Which part of this is science? Which part of this is opinion? How do we reconcile the competing opinions? show people that there really is a clear destination, and then most importantly, empower them so they feel as if they can get there from here. David, you use the analogy of climbing Mount Everest and, and empowering people with various tools and skill sets and, and giving them the, the ability to wade through what seems to be a, a complex terrain of, of mixed messages and food marketing and such and such. What is your take on so while certainly uh, their debates rage between this group of people that advocates this set of whole foods and that set of people which advocates that set of whole foods, it does seem like there is a bit of common sense and historical backing for saying if we were to simply eat things found directly in nature, aka what we did up until let's say 40 years ago for all intents and purposes, obviously there was canning and some level of preservation of food, but you understand my point that I don't know how close we could get to that 80%, but we'd be pretty daggone close. So could it be simplified to at least that level? Like if you can't find it directly in nature, chances are it's not helping you to become disease proof. In, in many ways, I agree completely, Jonathan. And, and in fact, you know, my own advice about simplifying the message, I like Michael Pollan's eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I often point out the opportunity, you know, trade up your choices, eat close to nature, learn to love foods that love you back. We're all saying the same thing in different ways. You know, essentially, uh, it's real food, it's natural food, it's minimally processed food. The, the concept is sound. The problem is the application because we're not getting our food directly from nature. We're getting our food in restaurants, and there they're mixed into dishes, and we're not in control of what goes into those dishes. So, you know, in nature, there are no restaurants. In nature, there are no cafeterias. In nature, frankly, there are no plastic bags. There's no styrofoam. You know, there's nothing that's prefabricated and put together. So you could say, well, then don't buy anything that comes in a package. And I've had arguments with the likes of, of Marion Nessel and, and Michael Pollan about these kinds of things because, frankly, 
dried lentils come in a package with a nutrition facts panel and an ingredient list and steel cut oats do as well. And I know almost no one who would argue against eating lentils or chickpeas or, or steel cut oats, but they are part of the same display on a supermarket shelf as a lot of other stuff that's more highly processed. So the trouble is you quickly get into shades of gray. You know, if it were black and white, you could go out of your, your front door with a bow and arrow in hand and really get your food direct from nature. Pick stuff off trees and, you know, shoot stuff that, that is running away that you want to catch and cook for dinner. Well, you know, it'd be a pretty simple story. But the reality is, you know, they're the opposite ends of the, the spectrum. There, there's, you know, organic spinach and there's fluffernutter. But there's an awful lot of stuff in the middle where, you know, okay, it's a lentil soup and the ingredients are all pretty much direct from nature, and, but it's still a prepackaged soup and it does have salt added. Do we call that a food from nature or do we call that a processed food? And what about those lentils which were dried and put in a bag? And, and, and you know, each time you think you've made a decision, there's some other what-if product that's very close to that one but maybe a little different. My insights about this, Jonathan, you know, other than having worked in this space – for 20 years, and, and right now we're, I'm writing with colleagues the third edition of my nutrition textbook for healthcare professionals, nutrition and clinical practice. That provides a bird's eye view. But as you know, I'm the principal inventor of the overall nutritional quality index algorithm, which powers the NuVal nutrition profiling system. And we, we cover that pretty extensively in Disease Proof as well. But NuVal is a nutrition guidance system, one to 100, the higher the number, the more nutritious the food. The company has scored over 100,000 foods. And the system is on display in over 1,700 supermarkets around the country, reaching about 30 million people. We've had an enormous opportunity to look at the, the subtle challenges of the food supply. <clears throat> and there are a lot of these foods that are mostly natural, but not quite exactly. You know, even, even meats for people who do eat meat, some are entirely pure. Some seem like they should be, but actually they've been infused with a saline solution, and sometimes that solution contains sugar, and the consumer may not even know it. And so you know, there, there are a lot of challenges because you're not going out your front door with a bow and arrow or you know, a scythe. Uh, you really are dependent on what stands between you and foods from nature, and that's, that's the entire food industry. And there are supermarkets there and cafeterias there and bodegas there and restaurants there. And so we need to be able to navigate that space. And until we reshape the food supply so all of it is more natural and more reliable and more honest and true, we have to be able to navigate successfully through that space where many of our choices come in shades of gray. It's not, it's not direct from nature, um, but you know, is it or isn't it close enough, like those steel cut oats? I mean, you know, that's not the same as picking you know, the, the grain out of a field and chewing on it, somebody has done something to those oats. They have been processed. Uh, extra virgin olive oil was put into a bottle. There's a nutrition facts panel on the bottle. And sitting next to that bottle are all sorts of other bottles. And all of the bottles and all of the bags and all of the boxes have health claims on the front. You know, so, for example, you may have a very humble cereal made from nothing but some whole grain. And actually, the nutrition facts panel will be less impressive than a cereal sitting right next to it that's been made from some highly processed grain but was then highly fortified. I think that the typical consumer is vulnerable to those distortions. You know, total cereal, the cereal itself is not highly nutritious, but they throw a multivitamin in at the end. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, it gives it the appearance of being the most nutritious thing in the whole damn food supply, right? You need a certain level of knowledge to get past that. So, Yes, I totally agree with you in principle that what we really want to do is simple. We want to eat close to nature. If it wasn't a food 100 years ago, it's not a food now. But we have to be able to get there from here. And again, I, I'm, I'm a public health pragmatist, and I want to help everybody. And in particular, I want to help people who most need the help. And, you know, and the people who are in a position to eat closest to nature right now you know, and then that might be you, and it might be me, and it might be Marion Nestle, and it might be Michael Pollan, and it might be Alice Waters with her restaurant in Berkeley, Chez Panisse, and you know, all the all the elite foodies may be all set right now, but they're the ones who least need the help anyway. You know, it's the average person who is shopping at a big supermarket and or maybe Walmart and trying to figure out what's what. They need help to navigate in the general direction of closer to nature, and we've got miles to go. 
David, you hit on two key points there, which is making ourselves disease proof seems like there's at least two routes. One is the individual empowerment and education that allows us to climb the what has become a Mount Everest of complexity out there. There's another approach we touched on a bit, which is blowing up Mount Everest so that you have flat terrain that everyone can just walk across very easily. And and especially speaking to the people who need the help the most, like it's very easy for us and even the listeners of this podcast who are likely already very, very healthy <laughs> to be like, yep, we're right, going to be right. even healthier now. My right. question, David, the, the, the issue to me is we have so clearly, and you outlined this in your book, Disease Proof, so well, we have so clearly linked putting certain substances into our body with disease, it seems the link is as clear as if you smoke, to the extent that you smoke, you are going to get lung cancer or you predispose yourself to lung cancer, aka if you don't want lung cancer, don't smoke. And because we understand there's that clear relationship, even though 60 years ago, the whole economy depended on tobacco and everyone smoked everywhere and there were secondhand smoke and blah, 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 blah. Because we saw such a tight relationship between that activity and disease, we we blew up Mount Everest. We made right. it much easier for people to avoid secondhand smoke, and we made it – no one smokes with any uncertainty about what it's going to do to them. How, how – at this point, how can we even excuse the fact that that isn't happening with, say, soda – I mean, things that nobody th would say is, is good for you. We still hear messages of moderation, yet no one says smoke in moderation. What, right. Where is the disconnect there? Well, uh, you raise an excellent point. And again, in the book, we have a whole section devoted to the, the essentially what would constitute the, the blowing up of Mount Everest, or actually, as we describe it, you know, building a levee to, to turn the obesogenic flood tide. You know? So to make the world a place where eating well is the norm and being physically active is the norm where you don't have to swim against the current to make that happen. It's what your culture does. The problem in blowing up Mount Everest or, or, or changing the world, you know, why we don't just do that with regard to food, even though we seem to have done it with regard to tobacco, is that actually in comparison to changing the food supply, tobacco was a molehill. You know, if we want eating right to be the Mount Everest of health promotion, Tobacco was a molehill, and I'll tell you why. Tobacco was never necessary. It's a, it's a modern part of human culture. We didn't have tobacco in the Stone Age. We didn't have tobacco when we were Homo erectus. You know, we, we've had food since before Homo sapiens were sapiens. It's always been part of our experience. It shaped our physiology. We actually have an innate craving for sugar. We're not born craving tobacco. There's an aspect of food we are born craving. It's part of our hard wiring. The relationship is so much more powerful and so much more intimate. Second, tobacco is an either-or choice. You can't tell people just don't eat. You know, if, it, if we could tell people just don't eat, if the choice were I eat or I don't eat, you know, not eating might be, might be hard, but it certainly wouldn't be complicated. You know, it wouldn't be subject to all sorts of competing theories. There, there are not lots of competing theories about how not to smoke. Now, there may be a few competing theories about the best ways to quit, but you know, fundamentally, not smoking is not smoking. There's very little debate about what that means. But eating well, there's enormous debate about what that means. And whenever you've got enormous debate, you've got enormous opportunity for hucksters and charlatans to get in on the act and distort perspective. You've got opportunity for Madison Avenue and marketers to get in on the act and say, okay, people know that certain nutrients are good for them. We'll throw those nutrients into a vat of gloop. And we'll know that it's putting lipstick on a pig, but the public doesn't need to know that. We'll pretend like it's really a good product. And so the next thing you know, you've got people who would be willing to quit smoking and are willing to eat better. But they know what quitting smoking means, and they really don't know what eating better means. So it's a vastly more complicated issue. It's never going to go away because we have to eat. And so we're, we're in this area where we do need to be informed to make better choices there are many more ways to get it wrong than with tobacco. Tobacco, you know, you can give it up entirely, you're getting it right, or you can smoke and you're getting it wrong. Everybody eats. Those who are getting it right eat, those who are getting it wrong eat, and those in between eat. And so, you know, we've got all of these subtle challenges to deal with. There's also the fact, Jonathan, that, that our culture really is built around the importance of food. 
every important human interaction in virtually every culture uses food as a centerpiece. We show generosity with food. We show love with food. Food has even infiltrated the vernacular. And in fact, the modern use of currency, money, really is just a surrogate for food. And that's the reason why we talk about things like being the breadwinner, bringing home the bacon, making dough, putting bread on the table. Actually, that's what food really was about. It was, it was the security that you could keep your belly full and, and keep the, the bellies of those you love reliably full because starvation was a constant threat. I mean, just think about how deep and profound and far-reaching and intimate and ultimately complicated that relationship is. So there you have Mount Everest. And in comparison, frankly, tobacco was a molehill. Now, we should do some things to dramatically improve the food environment. But one of the things we need to do first is empower the public to know what we reliably know about good eating. So let's cut through the clutter and the competing theories. Which part of this is reliable? You know, how, how do we really make practical use out of eat food, not too much, mostly plants, for example? Well, we address all of that in disease proof. I think the theme of healthful eating is extremely well and robustly established. I also think there's plenty of room for variation on the theme. I actually think you could have an optimal diet that's pretty paleo, and I think you could have an optimal diet that's vegan, that you know both are close to nature, but they're very different. And yet I think they're both variations on the theme of optimal eating. I think you could have an optimal diet that's Mediter Mediterranean or an optimal diet that's Asian, low fat. And I think by allowing for that variation on the theme and, and our science, the, the current state of the science does allow for that variation on the theme, it puts you in the driver's seat. It says, you know, you really can get pleasure in the pursuit of health and health in the pursuit of pleasure. You can love food that loves you back. And I think that's important too, because ultimately the value of health isn't health itself. The value of health is living. You know, the health is, is itself a currency that you can spend on, on, on days doing what you want to do. You have the energy, the vitality to do what you want to do. When we remember that health is for something, you know, you don't want to spend your life eating in a way that's unpleasant. You, you do want to love food that loves you back. I think there's an enormous opportunity there. But it's a huge challenge. I think it's a much bigger challenge than tobacco, and I think it is qualitatively different because tobacco was never necessary. Tobacco was not part of that fundamental group of exposures that actually shaped the development of human physiology. Food was here before human physiology existed. We invented tobacco. And David, therein, I think, lies the key. And maybe maybe the issue is not, because as you said, and, and certainly I, I would agree, that there are myriad food, and let's define food as things found in nature, there are, there are myriad uh, assortments of food diets that could allow someone to thrive. And certainly eating food has always been with us. Certainly we need to eat lots of food. In fact, many argue that eating more of the right kinds of foods is critical to maintaining health. But are we creating, are we, could the problem be overcomplicated in the sense that we haven't always had soda and soda doesn't have to be embedded in every human interaction, nor do Twinkies. And yet, yet those are sold in schools, whereas we don't even allow tobacco to be advertised. Because I think, I mean, let's, let's agree that saying, let's get meat, vegetables, fruits, uh, nuts and seeds to all be organic and local and blah, blah, blah. Like that's, that may never happen just from an economic viability perspective. But can't we just like, for example, there's cigarettes. Okay, there's soda. We don't have to have soda. It's very easy to target that thing individually. Why aren't we doing it? Well, a couple reasons. One, people don't like being told what to do. So, you know, you look at the struggles Mayor Bloomberg is having in New York with banning large sodas. It just, you know, it feels heavy handed. I think it ought to happen. The question is, how do we make it happen? Do we make it happen with supply side regulation or can we make it happen by informing the, the consumer and, and generating a change in the demand? And I, I think we have to carefully orchestrate the best ways to get there from here. 
But the other issue is, you know, again, it's a slippery slope. You know, on, on what basis do you say that soda is the, the single thing we should be regulating as opposed to, I don't know, pick something, you know, Pop-Tarts or, you know, um, toaster pastries in general or, or donuts or, you know, there are many vapid items in the food supply that, that really provide almost no nutrition of any value. And, you know, you could argue, well, it's on the basis of sugar content, but then you could identify things that have at least that much sugar content. And then it gets very insidious, very slippery slope, very fast. I mean, for example, there are pasta sauces that have more concentrated additions of sugar than ice cream topping. So do you say, well, well then, you know, we got to focus on pasta sauce, forget about the dessert aisle. And so in, in principle, I agree with you, Jonathan. Again, one of the things that, that the Nuval experience has shown me is how very quickly, unless you've got some objective standard, how quickly you get into the, the realm of slippery slope. And the, the problem isn't so much that, you know, we couldn't just, you know, sort of throw up our hands and say, well, you know what, let's just go ahead and do it anyway. Let's just ban soda is liquid candy. Let's get rid of it. You know, let's start somewhere. The problem then is that we have sort of forearmed the, the beverage association to say, why are you singling us out? You know, is it on the basis of sugar? Well, look at these other items that have as much or more added sugar. Is it on the basis of calories? Look at these items that have as much or more uh, added calories. Is it on the basis of missing nutrients? Look at these other items that have as much or more missing nutrients. Is it on the basis of contributions to obesity? And, and on and on and on it goes. I, I think we have a much more reliable basis for policy change when we invoke some generalizable standard. Now, frankly, now, and, and to some extent, of course, this is, you know, when you've got a hammer, you look out and see nails, but the, the Nuval system is the only nutritional profiling system ever devised to date that has been shown to correlate directly with out health outcomes. In a Harvard study of 100,000 people, the higher the average Nuval scores of their food, the lower the rate of cardiovascular disease, the lower the rate of diabetes, the lower their body mass index, the lower their rate of premature death from any cause. Well, you know, when you've got a system like that and it applies to all foods, you know, I think you could potentially invoke a, a more universal standard. And, you know, you were talking about schools and I feel passionately as well that schools should be in the vanguard of healthy living. So, you know, why not put food in categories? We'd have the beverage category, for example. We'd look at the, the range of scores there and say, you know, anything scoring in the bottom quartile of beverage scores can't get onto school grounds. You know, it's just we draw a line in the sand and nothing crosses. And you do the same for every food category. And you basically say, you know, every item on the, the kids' menus in public schools nationally has to clear a certain objective threshold. And, and that threshold is relative to the foods available. It's not an arbitrary threshold. You know, we, we basically stratified the scores of overall nutrition category by category. Now, you know, and, and frankly, we could flip it around as well. So that's sort of using the stick approach. I think there's enormous opportunity to use objective nutrition guidance for a carrot approach. I, I proposed, for example, that we could take a, a, a metric like Nuval, applied to 100,000 foods, and use it to incentivize purchases through the SNAP program. Right now, we, the American taxpayers, send $100 billion a year to the federal authorities to underwrite SNAP to help poor people choose poor food to get to poor health. We then pay a ton more money through Medicaid to cover the costs of all that poor health and pay for things like bariatric surgery and coronary bypass. How much more economical it would be if we scored all the foods available to SNAP beneficiaries, put them into categories, put them into quartiles, and said, if you buy a food in the bottom quartile of those scores, your dollar's worth a dollar. But if you buy a, a food in the next quartile up, your dollar's worth a dollar twenty-five, and in the next quartile a dollar fifty, and in the top quartile two dollars. And the more nutritious the food you buy in any given category, the less it will cost you, the more rewards you get. And then potentially we could help poor people choose better food and get to better health and save a ton of money doing it. Everybody wins. So, you know, again, I think it's really just a question of what works? How do we best get there from here? Efforts to tax soda. Yeah, I think they make perfectly good sense. But the beverage industry has fought them very effectively. Efforts to ban big soda you know, seems to be bogged down, uh, again, because it's an inconsistent application of policy. People get riled up because it's heavy-handed. I don't object to it. I haven't had a soda in 35 years. Uh, my kids you know, essentially don't know what soda is. They never see it in the refrigerator, except uh, my son brought them home recently to conduct science experiments. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, I kid you not. I mean, really, nobody in the house drinks them. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we need these fundamental changes in how we perceive food. Uh, you know, I think the first lady did a very nice job of pointing out you would never water your garden with Coca-Cola. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't pour it on a plant. You want it to grow well and you pour it into the body of your children. Hello. I mean, you know, are we really paying any attention to what we're doing here? So yes, I mean, honestly, I, I don't see any reason why anybody needs to drink liquid candy. But it really is a small part of a very big problem. And the food industry is very agile, very nimble. So, you know, if, if we say the problem is soda, we know how readily they can invent a new category, you know, and it'll be some highly sweetened green tea beverage. And, and then the other problem with these blunt, you know, top-down approaches is they, they are particularly incapable of nuance. Um, I had a, a colleague who was involved in founding the, the Honest Tea Company. Are you familiar with Honest Tea? I am, yes. Yeah, so it, I mean, it's a great product line. These are minimally sweetened uh, beverages that, you know, the, the main ingredient is some natural source, typically of green tea. Uh, they're fairly nutrient-rich. And, and really, they're, they're claim to fame is for people who are currently drinking sugar-sweetened beverages. These have vanishingly less sugar in them. But they are sugar-sweetened beverages, and they're, I think their standard bottle size was 16.9 ounces. And as, as you may recall, the Bloomberg soda ban, for example, was focused on 16 ounces as a cutoff. Well, it turned out that you know, anybody that coming under the, the Bloomberg ban would be unable to sell Honest Tea. Now, clearly the ban didn't have Honest Tea in its crosshairs, but you know, there you go. And so actually, uh, Barry Nailbuff, who's a colleague at Yale involved in, in establishing uh, the Honest Tea Company, wrote a, an editorial piece in the Wall Street Journal about the fact that you know, there are some unintended consequences here. So you and I agree about what needs to happen. Uh, I think where there's room for uh, useful, constructive debate is what do we really know about how best to get there from here? But in Disease Proof, what we focus on is the fact that no matter what the best way to change the world, changing the world is slow. And there are mm -hmm. going to be lots of arguments and counter arguments between here and there. And you've got skin in the game today. You've got skin in the game today if you're living today. You've got skin in the game today if you've got kids today because their skin is in the game. And you can't wait on the world to change. And so, you know, we talk about the importance of that ultimately. We do want to put health on a path of lesser resistance. We don't want everybody to have to work against the prevailing currents in our culture. But today, you can learn to get to health in spite of it all if you've got the right skill power. And the book is mostly devoted to imparting that because that's something you can use right now. And it seems like while we're, while we're waiting to uh, destroy Mount Everest or at least shrink it down to be a more surmountable hill we can all walk over, it seems, uh, David, we are beginning to talk almost in terms of a spectrum. We're on one end of the spectrum. You have disease proof or as close to someone can be uh, to disease proof. And when it comes to food, it seems like the closer the thing can be to nature, the fewer ingredients it has, things like that. Those go on that side of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, which is disease prone, seems like it is further away from nature and it has multiple ingredients in it. And all things being considered equal, if we use those two things as a guide, how close to disease proof do you think we could become? Well, that's the beauty of it, Jonathan. You know, again, you, you look at modern epidemiology and, and we can say with extreme confidence that 80% of all of the chronic disease we currently see affecting the world at large and the people we know and love could disappear. Now, you know, eventually we're, our parts are going to wear out. We're going to die of old age. But, you know, really the aspiration for, for humankind is to live robustly and then get old in a very short period of time, you know, just sort of wear out and pass on. Uh, we are mortal. We're going to check out at some point. But you want to have robust, good health for as much of the time that comes before then as possible. And it's chronic disease that steals that from you. And almost all of the chronic disease could go away. It, it's pretty much a matter of universal agreement that at least 80% of heart disease could be eliminated. At least 90% of diabetes could be eliminated. Cancer's a little more controversial, but as much as 60% of all cancer could be eliminated. Most dementia could be eliminated. Almost all respiratory diseases could be eliminated with you know, better control of exposure to tobacco around the world. So you, know, you, you do the math across the spectrum of chronic diseases. Those diseases that are most responsible in the modern world 
for years lost from life and life lost from years, 80% of that could go away. Then, you know, in, in terms of what remains, frankly, we probably could get rid of a lot of that if we went beyond, you know, just taking basically good care of ourselves to really optimizing the care we take of ourselves. And, you know, that would include then good medical care, appropriate screening, finding things early because some stuff will sneak through even if you take good care of yourself. And then we're talking about a reduction even beyond the 80%. And we also have very good evidence that lifestyle interventions, eating optimally, avoiding tobacco, physical activity, weight control can modify gene expression. So I think we can establish an 80% elimination of all the chronic disease, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that really bedevil modern living. The bad stuff, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, I mean, the stuff that we all dread and hope never happens to us or anybody we love, at least eight times in 10 that could go away. That's the floor, not the ceiling. How high is the ceiling? I don't think we know. I, I don't think we'll ever be able to 100% avoid disease because that's, you know, that requires a crystal ball. I mean, that, that's sort of, you know, human beings coming with a guarantee of future health and, you know, stuff can happen. Stuff can always happen. And, you know, I tell people, you know, every now and then I hear a story about so I was, I was a vegan and physically active and this happened or that happened. And I point out, well, you know, you can control ship and sail, but you never get to control wind and wave. And let's face it, you know, the, a wild, unpredictable tempest at sea can cause even the best captain ship to founder. So there will always be stuff that can happen. You don't get a guarantee. But it's absolutely stunning how close we can get to a guarantee. I mean, I'll take 80% any day. And the, the other important thing to realize about an 80% reduction in all chronic disease, compare that to any medical advance in history. It's bigger. Compare that to any Nobel Prize ever awarded in medicine. This is bigger. Uh, you know, there really has never been a medical advance to rival the power we now have and are squandering every day to use lifestyle as medicine. So you're asking me how high is up? I'm telling you it's way up. Folks, his name is Dr. David L. Katz. And hopefully if, if you've been listening to this, you've got goosebumps just like I do right now. And uh, the good news about Dr. Katz is that there is absolutely no shortage of information out there. Uh, David, you you must not ever sleep because the amount of work you do, uh, we'll follow up on that once we hang up the phone because I just need to learn uh, how you do that. It's pretty impressive. And folks, if you want to see all of David's work, uh, please check out David Katz. That's with a Z. So D-A-V-I-D-K-A-T-Z md.com. There is just a absurd, I'm actually scrolling through your list of articles. That's in addition to 12 books and all the other things you do. Lots of free information. So go check it out. David Katz, md.com. And the book we've been talking about is called Disease Proof. And the subtitle is The Remarkable Truth About What Makes Us Well. Dr. Katz, thank you so much for joining us today. Obviously a wonderful conversation. Jonathan, I couldn't agree more. I really raised wonderful, insightful points. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, we only scratched the surface, sir, so I do hope you will come back. I look forward to that. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. And please remember this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Talk with you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us, we would hugely appreciate it. 